Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Select Stream. Um, this one's all about cybersecurity and why you should really care. Um, we all know that cybersecurity breaches are becoming um, even more pertinent over the past 18 months since the pandemic, um, and businesses really need to make sure they have uh, mitigations in place. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to be discussing today in a nutshell. We, uh, I am Tess, um, I work in the marketing department along with my colleague Jig, who's also here with us. And today we're very excited to have not one, but two very special guests. So we have our very own cybersecurity manager, Russ Gawalich. Hi, Russ. Hello. And we also have a VIP guest, who is Ollie Venn. He is a cybersecurity engineer from WatchGuard. So thank you very much for joining us today, Ollie. No um, I kind of alluded a little bit to what we will be, or what you guys will be discussing today. Um, but maybe you could kind of give everyone a little bit of an overview of um, who you are, what you do, um, and what you're going to be discussing today. Maybe start off with you, uh, Ollie. Yeah, so uh, hi, thanks for having me. So I am, um, as Tess said, a cybersecurity engineer for WatchGuard based here in the uh, the UK, uh, covering UK and Ireland. Um, and yeah, we're going to discuss today sort of around the, the why we should care about cybersecurity. Um, often we have conversations with people and, and unfortunately the, the SMB can um, take the, the it'll never happen to me approach. Um, so today Russ and I are going to go through that and just talk about some of the, the cyber security challenges that you face and, and how we can actually protect you and, and, and offer those assurances for you. So a little bit about us. Um, WatchGuard uh, were, were founded in 1996 so we're based in Seattle. Uh, we're known um, sort of worldwide for our network security but we do have a good base um, around 1200 employees I think it's slightly higher now due to acquisition last year operations in multiple countries and direct presence like we do have here in the um, the UK and we operate through the channel so that means we work with great partners such as uh, select to make sure that we're delivering our products to you uh, and giving you the uh, the right services that you need for your environment so if we take a look at the next slide um, I'll cover off what we actually do as a, a security vendor. Um, like I mentioned, we're known for our network appliances. So the red um, firewalls that you would find in your, your data center. Um, and, and it's all about those sort of enterprise security for the masses. Um, and we do have some other pro uh, products in the portfolio, such as like secure Wi-Fi, offering protection for those all sort of network environments, uh, including the Wi-Fi. Multi-factor authentication, which we're going to talk about today as well uh, with OffPoint, and then also uh, our endpoint solution as well. So it's really an end-to-end -end solution that you can get with the uh, the WatchGuard portfolio. Over to you, Russ. Thanks. Um, I won't do much of an introduction on myself because most people either, either know me or it's not that important. Uh, so, but. Uh, much like Ollie, I'm from a technical background and cybersecurity is, is very much a passion of mine. Um, what I wanted to kind of bring to, to the table today is kind of the, the why me question. Um, what we tend to find in, in conversations, customers will ask, well, why me? Why would someone want to attack me? Why would someone come after my business? And it's, it's a good question to ask, but I think there's probably a narrow focus on it sometimes, the, the, the idea that um, we're not you know, a Fortune 500 company, we're not in the public eye per se, we're not a household brand. Why is someone going to come, come and knock on my door, so to speak? And like I say, it's a good question, but things to think about to put on people's agenda is kind of your industry. If you're in, in a vertical that's very heavily regulated um, in terms of um, kind of compliances, if there are a lot of fines that can be levied for loss of customer data, the bad guys are going to come and look for you. They know that they can lean on you and put pressure on you by exposing or threatening to expose information and thusly making you pay a ransom as, as a good example. Other ones are industries that have very critical uptime. Mm -hmm. So if you're really sensitive to your operations being disruptive, again, they don't need to break in per se, they just need to, be able to stop you working and they can hold you to hostage with that. We saw a pretty good example of that what, last month. It was the uh, VoIP providers being DDoSed yeah, they were having customers drop off left, right and centre. And it, it, it sounds silly, but if you can't make a phone call, 
a lot of the time your customers can't get hold of you and your team can't get hold of your customers so that's that's a big impact and um what's quite interesting i don't think a lot of companies really appreciate it but 70 or percent of incidents actually occur against businesses of 100 employees or less you know so wow. not big, not big businesses at all um in terms of why someone's going to do that I mean, like i say if you're in a, in a high risk kind of vertical that's one thing but it may be a case of you might be in a politically sensitive area uh environmental issues are, are a pretty good example of that you know if, if people feel that your company is is damaging a local area or damaging the environment you may draw activist attention and they may use cyber methods to disrupt your business to, to, to raise awareness to their cause um and again disrupt your operation so thinking about those things think about the the verticals you're in think about the attention you attract and just to I know so some paranoia but quite possibly <laughs> is even if you're not directly in one of those verticals or, or drawing that attention um are any of your customers or any of your suppliers could you be a means to an end you know again the, the focus is necessarily on you but if they know that you work with a, with a company that is of interest to them would they try and use you as, a, as an entry point and uh, possibly the last bit and i'd I always get a bit of a smile when having conversations about this because it's it's always a bit of a sensitive subject. Um, what we've seen kind of a growth of uh, globally is remote access brokers. So these are guys that are basically selling access into existing networks. They, they've got in somehow and they're, they're selling access to other bad guys. So the bad guys can either deploy ransomware and hold those businesses hostage. They can use their IT assets to launch attacks against other businesses. Um, so again, DDoSing, so just distributed denial of service, stopping another business working. Um, that takes resources. If they can use someone else's resources rather than buying their own or procuring their own, that's win-win for them. And it also hides their identity a bit better. But also one of the ways these, these remote access brokers can get into, uh, into a business is through your employees. You know, sometimes they will approach employees and offer to buy their login details from them. And wow. their house really? Yeah, well, I, I was talking to a chap at Microsoft um, a few months ago, and they're, they're seeing a problem at the moment where our <clears throat> a certain kind of demographic, so younger people, are getting jobs at, at, at bigger companies, and as part of that process, they are offering to sell their credentials to to, to people because it, wow. take take the positive spin, the naivety of it. It's a big company; they've got insurance. <clears throat> Excuse me, they've got all the the cyber security tools as a team in house. It's going to do yeah. no harm, and I've made a few extra quid, and yeah yeah it's quite a big risk though if you get found out you know well again it's, it's naivety and again i don't think um anyone's targeting any like a, a cfo for that kind of stuff are they well no i guess not but um <laughs> that's quite interesting because usually what we talk about is how um you know end users are targeted but more kind of through things like clicking a link by accident not actually you know, voluntarily giving away information. So that that's also, I guess, another concern for businesses as well, that, you know, there might actually be some, you know, foul play within their own staff as well. Yeah, it comes down to that, that great conversation about uh, empowering your people and looking after them. You've got to get, get to show them trust, but you also have to be aware that if a, an employee is disgruntled, they may kind of give you the middle finger as they walk out of the business. So to think mm -hmm. about things like that. Yeah, which um, is control and, and sort of understanding and, and what that employee has got access to and obviously making sure that they, they literally are limited to to the resources that they need rather than just giving a free for all and and having that sort of insight information because ultimately humans are always going to be the weakest link in the chain aren't they um, yeah. without most of our cyber security threats go away yeah that's that's Very a bleak outlook ollie <laughs> I was, I was going to try and add a positive spin to that. It's it's <laughs> true, yeah. But we, we are the weakest as an operator, so we do need. <laughs> yeah, we we are the weakest link because we'll we'll take the path of least resistance. Um, so that's where it's really important to have the dialogue between the business and and the employees to to understand what we're trying to do, and why we're doing things in a certain way where it protects us, it protects our customers. Um, and people aren't just taking shortcuts because it's quicker. You know, no, no one's going to do something that adds. 10 seconds to every task of their day unless they really understand the, the benefit to them and, and to the business. 
exactly and and it is that user friction if you can make the user adoption better by reducing the friction the the work that they've got to go through then they will adopt cybersecurity practices better um be more willing to to enhance those and, and sort of take care and, and sort of appreciate what they should be doing in a responsible for as well absolutely um i suppose that kind of brings us on to one of the the topics of what what would attract a, a bad guy to your business again if you're outside of so even if you're inside those, those kind of verticals we mentioned earlier and you've, you've got some method of getting in through you know a dodgy employee or malicious links and things like that um what is it they're after once they're in well yeah money is the primary objective and uh, i think long gone is the idea of the, the hacker in a hoodie per se um just for kind of the s and g's the the bad guys want to, to hold you for ransom to, to get some money out of you but also the data you hold can be really valuable um there's a, there's a great slide from uh, i think it's expedient that they do a kind of a, a summary of what the average value um records are go for kind of on the, on the, the dark market so to speak so you've got driver's licenses social security numbers people's credit card information it's already useful for the bad guys because for the monetary stuff it's free money great they can go and purchase other services they can go and commit fraud that way in terms of the um, person data well they can go and commit identity fraud they can go and take out loans they can go and get finance um there's a great uh, i think one of your guys actually ollie um I listened to your uh, the 443 podcast quite a lot and there was a, a few scams that was talked about on there where the they impersonate um, medical uh, insurers and doctor's offices. Yep. So the idea is they, they they submit an invoice pretending to be from a doctor's surgery and the, the insurance company pays out and it's, it's basically fraud. Yeah, yeah. And and, the, and that's quite common in America with the um, sort of private uh, health insurance and stuff that they've got. So it is right. And it, it is that just sort of extra information about the the users and, and their personal life. And it, it is so freely available, it's, it's quite scary. Um, the information that's out there about us, um, every single one of us, I'm sure, will have had some kind of details leaked or stolen um, through our cyber sort of careers and, and usage, really. Well, that's actually a, a pretty good point. Um, in that's kind of one of the things I think a lot of people kind of miss when they think about how they, they fall into, into someone's crosshairs. Um, we've all heard of the, the kind of high profile breaches we've got uh, was it Nintendo, um, Sony, Facebook every other week. Um, in, insert big name brand here and they at some point will have suffered some sort of breach. Um, and what the bad guys tend to go after besides all the other information which has value is they're after our contact information, things like our uh, email addresses, our telephone numbers, anything about us, because one, again, you're back to that, that um, impersonation fraud um, angle, but also you've now got a bit of a contact list. You know, if I know these are all Nintendo's customers, I can contact them as Nintendo. I've got a pretext, I've got a reason to send out the fishy email, I've got a reason to send out the, the SMS messages, which are getting more prominent because uh, the links are harder to, to kind of examine at first first glance so again your your defenses are down you are a customer of theirs you do know that they're going to talk to you oh i've got an email from them well, there's a problem with my account i better sort that out click the link and and they've got you um so that that it's quite a scary you think about it if you um and we've got a slide somewhere um of a, a breached data um report so we we provide a dark web monitoring service for our customers. I know WatchGuard do do a similar thing. Um, and what we get in there is basically a list of email addresses and passwords that have, that have been found. Um, and if you think about us as people, our, our identity online tends to be our email address. We, you know, it's, it's who we are everywhere. And we tend to use it everywhere and we tend to use the same passwords in a lot of cases. There's some bad habits there. Um, would you so say also using things like Facebook as your login, because that that can be used quite a lot on different sites. Is that quite um, a danger? Yeah, yes and no. If they, if they get access to the, your legitimate Facebook credentials, then, then yeah, because effectively they're, they're relaying the authentication. So this is where protecting things like those social media platforms and your email accounts becomes significantly more important because they're kind of the keys to the other keys if that makes sense if you, yeah if you ever get locked out of one of your accounts what do you do you hit the reset button and it sends you an email 
so if I've got hold of your email, I've got hold of all the keys. Um, so yeah, so from from the bad guy's point of view, they've got a lovely list of, of kind of pre-groomed customers they can contact with pretext. They've got credentials they can possibly use, so they don't need to necessarily do any fraud or any um, you know, phishing emails and phishing calls. They can just, just start signing in as you, and that creates a jump point for them for other victims. I think we've talked about it before uh, on one of these webinars where, you know, if I were to send out links to random people, they're never going to click them. If I go in as one of their friends or family and send the same thing, that click rate is going to go through the roof because that that barrier of trust is is is, is there. But the barrier of suspicion is down. The, the trust is there, and they're going to expect to have communications from these people. So it's really That's important what's happening in in organisations as well. Um, Often I have conversations with people and they'll be like, okay, I want to secure my executive team. I want to secure the accountants and the people because they're all doing the financial bits and pieces. And nine times out of 10, probably more than that, it's not them that get targeted originally. It'd be somebody else along the chain that maybe is viewed as being less important. <laughs> uh, everybody in the business is just as important as each other. But to a hacker, it's, it's those people further down the chain that don't have the same level of protection. They can get into an account that way send an email to somebody in payroll hey have i been paid have a look at this link or something and they're more likely to click it and, mm. and that's we certainly see a, a lot of it's that lateral movement with the uh, the attacks um starting that way yeah it's just picking picking your little battles and working your way through i was like the the analogy i had a conversation with a customer the other day where oh, we've got mfa rolled everywhere and there's a pause apart from because you know it's coming apart yeah. from oh yeah the cfo doesn't like it, it's a pain yeah. This person's name is going to be on company's house. They're going to have quite a high profile profile on social media. They're the people that are going to get a lot of phishing attempts. And again, once you've got that internal employee's account, here's a person I can go after. And then they've got the authority. And again, a lot of you guys have seen this a lot. A lot of the um, the emails use more social engineering than technology as a, as a as a mechanism so yeah. they're coming with the authority i'm your boss i need this thing happening yeah Some, someone's dropped the ball we've got to do it in 24 hours there's time pressure as a consequence and it's all designed to make you do something that ordinarily you'd say well, hang on there's no rush for that that sounds weird yeah. and you see it all the time i guess yeah, we... then it's kind of it i mean educating um employees about phishing attacks and um, other types of breaches is obviously still really important, but I guess it's also the education around. Uh, sounds a bit harsh, but you know, actually, even though it might seem a bit more laborious to take on things like MFA, you know, don't just kind of what's the word when uh, something seems a bit annoying, but actually, it's still really important. Don't dig your heels in. <laughs> yeah, and I guess, you know, a, a little bit of inconvenience is is that education around, you know, accept the inconvenience for the greater good of the business and for also your personal security as well. Because I think we can all be, it's like most humans, you know, we want to find the quickest route to get to something. And if it means we have to like go through, you know, go through different processes, we want to try and eliminate that. So you can see why there is that kind of resistance um, to MFA. And I guess that's why we, you know, we include them, um, obviously. Um, we do bullfish training. So all of our end users have access to uh, training against cyber breaches um, and understanding that that they can be um, a risk. Uh, but I, I guess there's probably still quite a lot of businesses that and people that work in the businesses that sounds bad but may not know or also just don't really care so i guess it's kind of it's i think there has to be a level of education but maybe also enforcement so that guy like you said about russ he didn't want to use mfa because it's inconvenient or it takes too long i guess it's having a company policy that doesn't really matter what you think you've got to use that so is there an element of that that you would recommend businesses um yeah it, it's, it's kind of multi-pronged so i think the dialogue is an important bit making people understand and aware um if you just say do this thing and they cannot do the thing because it's, it's a hassle they will not do the thing again part of least resistance so you've got to have the dialogue to make them feel involved make them feel part of the solution because at the end of the day if you are 
from a top down point of view, if you've got a, a, a process to push out and it makes their life harder, they're not going to do it. Also, it's, it's inefficient for the business. The business case doesn't stack yeah, up yeah. for it. So make them part of that dialogue, make them part of defining the solution and help them understand why it's important. Um, and then have the tools to help enforce it. And in, in terms of MFA is one of my favourite kind of topics on this, because if people complain that MFA is a pain, it's because they've got the wrong one. Um, <laughs> I mean, we did a I we did a blog about this. You know, if, you, if you've picked an MFA solution where you're having to write a code down, you've got ten seconds to type it in, and you're going back and forth, and this yeah, yeah no one's going to use that. It's a, it is a pain. I completely sympathise. If you have something simple and slick, and you integrate it properly, there's less resistance, there's less argument, and there's less risk. Yeah, exactly. And I think that it is kind of that mindset. If if you have come from sort of like the IT background, and you thought about the old 2FA days where you needed the hardware, that you needed the infrastructure, you need the, the tokens that you said timed out after 10 seconds. And if you got them out of sequence, you had to re... It, it, 2FA used to be a real nightmare to manage. And, and I've done it. I was an end user. I was infrastructure and security lead for a company, quite a large company in the UK. And, and I've gone through all of those pains before, but it's come on so far since then that it literally is, I'm gonna log into my laptop and I want MFA on there. So I enter in my username and password as I would do normally. I hit enter as I would do normally. And all of a sudden on my mobile phone, I've got a push message come through saying, I'm trying to sign into my laptop, is that me? Yes. And that's it, that's all it needs to be. Yeah. yeah. I, it's that yeah. mindset that this is a lot more involved when really it's not, it's picking up your phone, which you probably got on your desk anyway, and just pressing, yes, that's me, sign me in. Mm. Um, and that is one of the things with MFA is just changing that mindset of, of how it is for, for the users because it really is easy and, and everybody should be using it. If you've got any kind of credential that's publicly available on the internet, whether that's VPNs, software as a service, things like Office 365, anything that can be accessed on the internet using a username and password should be secured with MFA because mm. at some point in time it probably will suffer a breach. Yeah. Yes, it's a, it's a ticking uh, clock, that one. Yeah. And actually, you, you bring us onto an, an interesting bit um, when you're exposing things to the internet. And this is probably, I, I almost wonder from a technical point of view, it, it seems like a legacy thing, but it's kind of not because, you know, we, we're kind of used to as, as in, infrastructure people exposing things to the to the web because our staff need to work with it. And it's, you know, we used to have our own in-house exchange servers and push that to the web. You'd have applications that you are exposing a login for. And that was kind of the norm for a long time. And as technology has moved on, we're going to more and more cloud services to do this stuff. And the security is kind of baked in for us. The patching's baked in. They've got 2FA nine times out of 10, whether it's turned on or not is, is another matter. But it's still surprising how many businesses are exposing stuff to the web at a convenience without thinking about what it actually does. Um, and this is one of the other things that I, th I think can, can bring customers into into the bad guys crosshairs without them realizing is kind of just what have you got? You know, a lot of these criminals have a preference to certain platforms. They're, they're good at breaking into exchange servers. We saw that earlier in the year with the, the, the Hafnium thing. You didn't need any credentials. You didn't need anything special other than a bit of scripting. You just push it to the, to the email server and you had a foothold. Um, so there, the bad guys are out there actively looking at what is just connected to the internet, and what they can see, and they don't care that it belongs to you or anybody else. It's just, oh, that, that's an IP address that responds. It's running a bit of software I've got some, some exploits for. I'm pretty tasty at breaking into. I'm going to get into there, and once I'm in there, I'm going to explore, and then you know I can start selling access to this business. Well, do you know what? I might ransomware. You, you look like you, you could pay some bills. Let's, let's, let's do this. Um, as a little screenshot actually at the moment, I've, I've used a, a tool called Showdown. So this is a nice visual representation and I've looked at exchange servers and you can see I, I've, I've blurred out some bits, you know, names change, protect the innocent and all that. Um, but there's a, there's a bit in the middle where it says CVEs. These are all vulnerabilities that are publicly known about and there's probably exploit code for, you know, GitHub's a great repository for stuff like that. I shouldn't plug it. Um, but yeah, I, I can go and look at what exploits um, those CVEs are open to and then maybe throw some of those at that server. And that server's got to be open to the internet because it's an exchange server. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing is it's so easy to test for vulnerabilities now. We saw it with the uh, the exchange vulnerabilities earlier this year. And so many businesses got attacked so quickly because they have tools that are pre-spun up for them where mm. they can go and write, I want to scan everybody in the UK to see who's got open. And it basically, if you had an an exchange server that was publicly available with these vulnerabilities, the chances are you got hacked and you got breached 
because of unpatched services. Mm-hmm. You just don't know about it yet. <laughs> I guess just I'm conscious of time. That kind of leads quite nicely on to, I suppose, what are the ways that businesses can mitigate that risk or be a bit more educated about um, solutions? Yeah, so, um, I mean, there's there's some uh, sort of key topics that we as WatchGuard can talk about. Um, and, and it is layering up the security. There is no one solution. I think we've already sort of alluded to this with the conversations. You, user education is really good but also then layering that up with MFA. So if we look at like malware and sort of how to protect against ransomware, it, it's it's layering up those defenses. So we, we don't want that malware to land on the endpoint at all. So obviously if we can keep it at the firewall level, making sure that we're using a good firewall, so for example, the fireboxes at WatchGuard, there are three different AV scan engines available to them to protect that. But then we use multi-factor authentication as well on those endpoints to prevent like lateral movement um, and obviously endpoint protection as well. Um, so changing the mindset and going to a zero trust model so we only allow what's good to run on those endpoints um, is, is really critical. And that's something that we're, we we now do and offer and, and see as a valuable service. And then if we look at the, uh, the, the next slide, um, this is all about the, the spear phishing and those sort of account takeovers. And it's all similar technology. So again, multi-factor authentication. If a user's credentials do become leaked or breached, ensuring that nobody can use them. Um, DNS firewalling is a great way of stopping uh, phishing attacks. So when a user clicks a link, the very first thing that happens is it's gonna do a DNS query. So if we can stop it at the very first protocol and know that that's trying to take them to a phishing site, that's perfect but also adding in training for the user. There's no better time to teach somebody than when they've just made a mistake, that in the moment training. So rather than just giving them a blocked page, you've tried going to a phishing site, we can send them to a training portal and be like, hey, here's a five minute phishing training exercise. So then they can go back to the source of that leak, whether it was a, a the link rather, whether it is an email, and try and spot the signs that that's a phishing attempt. So then hopefully the next one that comes through, they take a little bit longer before clicking the link and be like, ah, here's the the signs that this was a phishing attempt. I should have spotted this. And then finally, if we look at the uh, the final slide on this one, um, is about those remote employees. Like, how do we secure those as well? Because let's face it, 18 months ago, we were suddenly faced with a situation where everybody had to work remotely and it's like, OK, what do we do? And we security probably wasn't at the forefront of your mind. It was enablement. Let's get them turned on for the VPN. Let's get them connected remotely. Um, so if well, let's hopefully you've got mobile VPN. I mean, Russ mentioned about sort of exposing things to the Internet and we, we do see that and that's definitely not best practice. So if you can secure those resources, so things like remote desktop computers, put them behind a VPN get your users to connect in for a firewall first, obviously adding multi-factor authentication to that, don't just rely on the username and password, but also the endpoint protection. Again, making sure that they're running zero trust, that they've got the DNS firewall in that user education because they're at home. You don't know what their fridge freezer is doing with its IoT devices connected. Mm. <laughs> It's sniffing your home network traffic, looking for things that are connecting on VPNs. So making sure that those endpoints are protected as well, whether they're in the office, at home, wherever, they need to make sure that those uh, are protected with a good endpoint security that runs zero trust application service. Well, that sounds quite scary, being hacked through your fridge. It's, 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 one, it's, of it's, it's one of your predictions, isn't it? The, so watch God do a, a threat report. And one of the predictions, I think, is a lot of people are going to be compromised through their home router because the, the kit that your provider provides is it's crap. It's basic, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or crap, yeah. <laughs> How many security updates happen sort of on a weekly, monthly basis? And your fridge freezer that you've connected to give you online reports every now and then and doesn't actually do anything, but you've connected it to the internet because it's got an internet connectivity. Hasn't been updated in the last three years. How many vulnerabilities is that now carrying? It's just an open door into your networks, your home networks, but also your then corporate network if they can get onto your machine and see that you've got a VPN connected. Um, so yeah, <laughs> don't connect anything to the internet unless it needs to be connected to the internet. If, if in doubt, deploy the tin for hat and the scissors, we're, we're OK. <laughs> great, and I think we just had, that was a great conversation, guys. Thank you so much. Um, I think everyone learned quite a lot. I certainly did. Um, we do actually have one last slide. It's a next step slide. And really, if, if 
there was anything there that you found interesting, useful, hopefully there was, um, <laughs> things that you want to know more about, um, you know, get in touch with us, get in touch with Select Technology. We can, um, so WatchGuard can actually offer um, some free uh, trials of some of their solutions, such as the endpoint protection, um, DNS WatchGo and AuthPoint MFA. Um, we also offer um, free dark web scan reporting as well at Select Technologies. So, you know, please get in touch um, to make sure your business is covered and as secure as it can be. Um, so I don't know if there's anything, any lasting uh, words of wisdom you guys want to leave. But um, before you do that, I just want to say massive thank you to um, everyone who's watched today. Um, and also our very special guests, Russ and Ollie. Um, thanks for your time, guys. No problem. Um, great. Um, any last words of wisdom? That you any parting words? I'll, I'll just reiterate exactly everything that Ollie said. You know, look at your tech stack. Make sure you've got some tools in. And again, I go back to the dialogue bit. Uh, at the end of the day, your people are your last line of defence. In some cases, you, if you don't have the technology, or if the technology fails for one reason or another, it, that human firewall is going to be the last bit. So make them part of the conversation. Um, make them part of the solution. Again, you need to get their buy-in and get them to see the value in what you're doing. Yeah, and and I just want to add. Just don't feel like you're alone. Um, working with partners like Select Technology is a great opportunity to understand your security posture. Um, it is one of the, the shortfalls across the world is, is IT security professionals. So not every business has got a security expert inside them. And that's why leveraging partners like Select are perfect because they can help you understand shortfallings. They can get you spun up with trials. Um, to, to sort of plug those holes and just understand what you actually need from them and, and technology as well to, to get yourself protected. Great, thank you so much, Ollie. That's some brilliant advice from both of you. Thank you so much once again.